Tonight on Frontline, they were just playing corporate hardball. The company was growing, cash was growing. Squeeze and leverage suppliers. But it got out of hand. Cabinets stuffed with held checks. I don't know, $10 million. Kept sucking deeper and deeper and deeper. Frontline correspondent Paul Solman investigates how one high-rolling entrepreneur and his loyal followers covered up one of the largest corporate frauds in United States history. Fool the auditors. Cook the books. Tonight on Frontline, how to steal 500 million. Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is Frontline. Radio 57 WKBN, Youngstown, Ohio. We get your opinions of Mickey Monus on WKBN. First, uh, we go to Youngstown. What do you think about Mickey Monus? The guy was a hero in this area. Jim, you're on WKBN. Hello. Yeah, Al Capone, Dillinger, Mickey Monus, they're all the same. I'll tell you what, uh, he played uh, Youngstown for a bunch of hicks from Mayberry. That's what I think. I thank you. On WKBN to the east side. Sam, you're on Great Talk Radio. Hello. I would like to say that the Mona family has done more good for this valley than any harm to this valley. And Mickey was trying to do the same. I think the books were cooked. And Mickey was not aware of the books being cooked. What do you think of Mickey Mona? 782-8191 in Youngstown. That's 782-8191. In Youngstown, Ohio, it's the fraud of the century. And they're still arguing as to how hometown hero Mickey Monus wound up losing $500 million of other people's money while building what seemed to be a retail empire, a discount chain called Farmore. I'd like to introduce at this time Michael Monus, the president of Farmore, who brought us to 33 states from zero to 300 stores. Thank you, Carol. And having reached this 300 store, there's no stopping us now to being a national retailer and to having store in every major market across the country. Mickey Monus, crook or classic entrepreneur, depending on your point of view. The story of Farmore is a tale of fraud, one of the largest in American corporate history. But it's also a modern morality play, in which previously honest people, hired more or less at random, sustained the fraud for years. We'll show you how they did it. But you'll have to decide for yourself as to why and why they were allowed to carry on by everyone in a position to stop them. From investors, to the board of directors, to the auditing firm of Coopers and Librand. But maybe the best question to ask as you watch the fraud unfold is simply this. What would you have done had you been a part of the juggernaut that was far more? Some people in this world have one thing on their mind, deals. In 1982, Monus opened his first farm war, a deep discount store that sold everything from prescription drugs to shampoo, all at unbelievably low prices. A key to low prices was power buying. Monus's catchphrase for loading up when suppliers offered rock-bottom deals, thus creating far more savings for cost-conscious customers. The prices were so low, competitors couldn't figure out how far more did it. Monus looked like a winner to David Shapira, the Pittsburgh grocery executive who bankrolled the new venture and served as its CEO. Shapira had the credibility, Monus the gambling spirit. Strong sales at the first store so impressed Monus's bosses that a second store followed within seven months. Within a year, there were eight. To help him build the new firm, Monus hired young men. Many of them lacked experience, but they made up for it in loyalty to the boss. To run accounting, he chose Pat Finn. You could see yourself um, going after problems, challenging yourself, solving problems. In accounting, you know, you, you worked through a problem, there was a right answer and a wrong answer. Things were, things were black and white. And uh, 
And that's probably part of my personality. Things are black and white. Things are either right or wrong. To Pat Finn, the ethical calls had been easy until he met Mickey Monas, a man with a brash exterior but an inspiring ability to create jobs and make money. He had the ability to motivate all of his, uh, everyone who worked for him to, to have that same type of fire and that same type of dedication towards farm work. Monas used his growing reputation as a business prodigy to boost his hometown. He was often on the front lines at public celebrations, inviting people to believe in whatever enterprise he pushed, whether it was farm work or a summer camp for local city kids. He became almost like a cult figure. He really did. He, he was bigger than life. He was bigger than life. He could do no wrong. He had the Midas touch, however you want to say it. Uh, he, was, he was a very, very important person in, in, for the psyche of the Youngstown area. Word of Monus's success spread quickly among local banks and investors, who in the recessionary days of the early 1980s were starved for fast-growing investment opportunities. People looked upon Farmore as perhaps the greatest success story in the retail industry ever. I remember when, when Sam Walton from Walmart came out and made the announcement that the only company that he fears at all in the expansion of Walmart, his number one competitor is Farmore. As it grew, Farmore found itself up against Walmart in mall after mall. In 1985, there were 12 stores. By 1987, 40. To win in the world of deep discount, you beat the other guy's price and hope to capture his customers. So, for the next two years, Monus committed Farmore to underselling Walmart. But the prices were so low, he began losing money in those stores. Pat Finn watched nervously as year by year the profit margins of the entire company eroded. By 1989, he realized Farmore now faced a loss of millions. Finn went to Monus with the bad news. Mickey Monus was in a tough position. Five years into running what had seemed a white-hot company in a sizzling industry, he was losing money. What were his options? He could announce the losses and risk losing his credibility, his credit, and quite possibly his company, or he could buy a little time by parking the losses temporarily and put more effort into improving efficiency, getting lower prices from suppliers, something that would enable him to turn a profit once again. Monas chose to buy time, according to his chief financial officer. Pat Finn states that when he brought the disappointing results to his boss, Monas simply crossed them out with a pen and wrote in higher numbers showing a profit. Now, this was illegal, but the report was mainly an internal document. Farmore was lying primarily to its owners. According to Pat Finn, Monas continued to change the weekly financial reports for four months before entrusting the task to him. Monas refused to talk to us about this or any other issue, but Pat Finn gave us his account. You knew you were doing something wrong, but you never understood how wrong. I think he, he helped me believe that, you know, starting it for him, uh, I was being a team ball player, give him time and he'll fix the problem. The true numbers were kept in a separate set of books called the Subledger. And Farmore's accounting manager, John Anderson, was brought into the plot to keep track of the temporarily altered figures. It was really a report that you know, Pat Finn wanted done, wanted to keep track of so he can see where everything was at and, and what, uh, I guess, uh, problems he needed to cover. Finn had hired Anderson directly out of Youngstown State University, where this kind of accounting presumably was not part of the curriculum. Pat Finn always ha had an aggressive approach to accounting and call it uh, aggressive or call it creative. Uh, that's the way it was done ever since I remember. Now, losses can be parked for a while, but eventually they need to be covered with something tangible. By Finn's account, Mona set out to cover the shortfall by putting the arm on Farmore's vendors. Merchandise 
Joe's now open. Strawberry kiwi. Let me try that. And you're beautiful. Thank you kindly. Thank you. The merchandise show, where retailers and vendors haggle over the price of, say, a year's supply of strawberry kiwi juice. For years, the name brand vendors had the power here. But the success of huge deep discount chains like Walmart and now Farmore had gradually tilted the balance. The chains were now big enough to muscle the suppliers. They were certainly in a position to squeeze and leverage suppliers, no doubt about it. Everyone is under pressure to make sales. Here's a company that looked like it was going to be another Walmart. Monus's inspiration was to squeeze upfront payments from vendors in return for not selling their competitors' products. He'd use these exclusivity fees to cover his losses. They may have said to one company, we'll keep your line if you'll give us $500,000 or $1 million fee. And if they said no, they would go to the other company and give them the business. They'd give them the business all right. Coca-Cola, for instance, paid far more $10 million to keep Pepsi out of far more for just five years. Vendors let themselves be strong-armed by a retail newcomer without ever wondering, it seems, if the Farmore phenomenon was for real. Meanwhile, Farmore's accountants used the millions in exclusivity fees to help offset the losses they were hiding, which had now reached $18 million. But the fees were not enough. Farmore wasn't Mickey Monus's only interest. He had invested in over a dozen other businesses and even had the moxie to take on the National Basketball Association. Did you ever think you'd be a professional basketball bearer here? Always well, a dream got of mine. Really? Right. Did you play ball? Just in high school. And uh, how tall are you? 5'9". Five 5'9". Nine. Five nine. So you could have made this league sometime if it was 20 years ago. I don't think I have the quickness. Okay. Let's go back to courtside and jam. Monus's World Basketball League had a hook. No player was taller than six foot five, and the nine teams were located in smaller markets, in cities like Youngstown. There's a lot of people who lose a lot of money in minor league sports. So, yeah, it was a challenge because he was going to, again, do something that nobody had done. He was going to be a success where others had failed. As at Farmore, Monus concentrated on image. He personally assembled the All-American Girls, a professional cheerleading squad which traveled from game to game throughout the country. He pushed to popularize the league by broadcasting games, using a TV production company he bankrolled with borrowed money. But how could Monus, whose far more was hemorrhaging money, think he could make a pro sports league fly. These were people, you know, who uh, had extreme confidence in their ability. And, and it was just kind of a foregone conclusion that and if we're going to create a new basketball league from scratch and we're going to make money on it when no one else has, well, hey, we're the people who started Farmore. We can do, we can do these kind of things. But in reality, things at Farmore were a mess. Even with the exclusivity money, the company was still facing a $12 million loss, and the auditors were coming. So how do you make a $12 million loss disappear? Well, you can start by dividing it up into smaller amounts. $12 million divided by 129 stores comes out to $93,023 and about 25 cents a store. So you put that on the expense side of each store's ledger. And to make it balance, you need to add ninety-three thousand twenty-three dollars and about twenty-five cents to each store's assets now you can't claim cash you haven't got any auditor can see through that but you can claim another category of assets your inventory is worth more than it actually is and that's the first thing they did so far more claimed every six pack of coke in the store was worth say two dollars and thirty cents when in reality it may have sold for a buck ninety-eight Multiply that difference by thousands of six-packs of Coke in 129 stores, and you're on your way to a $12 million cover-up. It's a whole new world facing today's chief executive. Competition is fierce. 
But how could Farmore's respected auditors, Coopers and Librand, who sell themselves on their know-how, be so easily fooled, especially since a good auditor checks the inventory while it's physically counted? Now, you can't check all the inventory in every store. Moreover, Coopers, having won the Farmore account with a very low bid, wanted to limit its costs. So Coopers checked only four stores out of 129. And get this, Farmore found out from Coopers which locations would be checked months in advance. So when Coopers arrived to examine the stores, it's not too surprising that everything appeared to be in order. We went to Coopers and Librand to ask them why they were unable to uncover the fraud. An accountant is a watchdog, but not a bloodhound. Uh, an accountant cannot be expected uh, to search out and find every piece of fraud. Uh, it's, there's, a, there's really a big difference between being a bloodhound and a watchdog, and I think that's an important distinction. But perhaps a fair question is not whether Coopers was hired as a bloodhound, but whether the watchdog was asleep. With only a tiny sample to go by, Coopers accepted Farmore's inflated inventory figures year after year, even though Finn couldn't back them up with documents. In the end, the auditors not only bought Farmore's numbers, but declared that the company had actually earned a record profit in 1989. In the next two years, Farmore grew, and by all appearances, it continued to prosper. <laughs> to the folks back home, Mickey Monas had become a legend who breathed new life into their old town. He just produced jobs for everybody. You know, not just the jobs around Youngstown, but around the country because every time they opened a store they hired more people. Kim's Cafe was where far more executives came to celebrate their victories. Monas, the local boy made good, would occasionally stop by to serve as celebrity bartender. All the girls from upstairs uh, requested, I forget the title of the song, but um, it went, uh, Mickey, Mickey, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blow our mind. And, uh, They'd be singing it over there, and then they'd be all pointing over this way at the bar. And, it, and then it got the whole dining room singing the song. Despite monumental losses, Monas played on, as if nothing were wrong. He'd apparently convinced himself that Farmore was destined for glory, and with salary and bonus of half a million dollars, he lived accordingly. In addition, he took another half million dollars to add a room to his house, to pay off a rather generous visa balance, to pick up an engagement ring for his new fiance. Monas developed an attachment to posh West Palm Beach, where his second marriage took place, poolside, at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. The bride wore gold, an 18-carat gold mesh gown donated for the day by a vendor, Absolute Vodka. It was worth more than half a million dollars and came complete with two armed guards. Monas loved the high life, loved to be where the action was. It would be three o'clock in the afternoon and they'd say, let's go to Vegas and we're going now. Just, just take your wallet and let's go. And we would fly into Las Vegas and there would be a limo from Caesar's Palace that would meet the plane on the tarmac and we would get taken to, the, uh, to Caesar's Palace and, and there would be a suite for Mickey 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It did not matter when we came there, there was always a suite. Monas was at home in the world of big bets and make-believe. He even built three stores in Las Vegas. And then there was the nightlife. Life was a game. Life was just this ride you're on. You know, you're working hard, you've got all this money, you know, coming through your hand, whether you own it or not, you know, that's for someone else to decide, but you have the power, the ability to do anything. 
the gambling was insane. I mean, my coaches would come back and say, yeah, Mickey gave me $4,000 to gamble with last night, and I lost it all. Monus's activities would eventually be scrutinized by bankruptcy examiner Jay Alex. The sense I have is like it was a boys' club. It was like a big boys' club is what it was, and they were having a great time, and the company was growing, and cash was flowing, and there were no rules and restrictions, and they were hot. But at Farmore, back in 1990, they were beginning to feel a different sort of heat. Losses were now more than $45 million and growing, but Monus refused to raise prices or retreat. He just couldn't admit defeat. It's a flaw that he had. He just couldn't look himself in the mirror and say, hey, we made a mistake here. We got to fix it and we got to go on. To cover up the continuing losses, Pat Finn was now faxing falsified financial reports to the board of directors and to David Shapira every week. But in November of 1990, a secretary mistakenly faxed a report with the real numbers to Shapira. Here in black and white was a report which no CEO could ignore. While Shapira was ultimately responsible for far more, he'd long ago left day-to-day -day operations to Mickey Monus. When he saw these startling numbers, Shapira summoned Pat Finn to his Pittsburgh offices. Pat Finn told David Shapira that, you know, everything, uh, th th those are just preliminary numbers, we have to make some adjustments to them, and once we make the adjustments to them, then they'll, they'll be okay. In the end, the CEO of Farmore failed to check the figures independently. He seems to have bought Pat Finn's excuse. Now remember, we're three years into the fraud. Is CEO David Shapira really as gullible as he seems? Well, a cynic might say that considering Shapira's huge personal stake as a major shareholder in Farmore, he believed Finn because he wanted to. After all, he put his money on Mickey Monus, just like Pat Finn, the people of Youngstown, the banks, vendors, and investors. But what none of them knew was just how bad a bet they'd made. The deficits continued to grow, and knowledge of the fraud was now about to extend to another member of the company. Stan Cherelstein joined Farmore in 1990. He quickly rose to the position of controller, a job that placed him in charge of all cash disbursements. Well, I, I learned about the fraud almost two years after my joining the company. That's when John Anderson took me into his office and closed the door and told me that, well, you're the controller for Farmore now and, and you should be aware of this situation. And he pulled out a subledger schedule and uh, told me basically that the financial statements at the end of June 1991 were misstated by approximately $150 million. If anybody was likely to blow the whistle, it would seem to have been the newcomer, Stan Cherelstein. But he didn't. He, too, was persuaded to toe the line. I felt that through exclusivity money, through perhaps raising the prices, I felt that there were some options at that point that Pat and Mickey had available to them to correct the situation. And that's why I stayed on with the company, and that's why I never told another soul. Uh, that coupled with uh, a fear that I, I believe I had at the time, that maybe if I did go over their heads, maybe some harm could come to myself. Physical harm? Physical harm. John Anderson had spent much of his four-year career inside the fraud. Cherylstein was the closest thing he'd found to a moral compass. He was able to make a lot of sense of things and, you know, seem to to give opinions and, and seem to say that no, this is not the way it should be. Uh, we should be doing things this way, or uh, no, that is absolutely wrong. And um, he was in there actually trying to to fight and trying to change things and. It just you know, it was up against a brick wall. Hiding the fraud was becoming more and more of a problem. The company was frequently strapped for day-to-day -day cash. Bills went unpaid for months. 
We had cabinets stuffed with held checks at the company that had been generated out of the accounts payable system, but we couldn't mail them because if we mailed them, the checks would have bounced. So they kept accumulating and accumulating. By the spring of 1991, Farmer was holding back $155 million it owed to vendors. They retaliated by halting shipments to some stores. Shoppers began to notice an unusual sight, empty shelves, an image at odds with far more TV ads, which promised customers everything. Far more continued to live in its dream world, even though CEO and board member David Shapira knew about most of the held checks. Discover how far more's power buying gives you far more buying power. This is the kind of issue that would rise to a, a board level concern, I would think, in most companies. When a company needs hundreds of millions of dollars more than it planned on, uh, the question would have to be asked why. So what was more important to Shapira and the directors than pressing for explanations? Perhaps selling far more's stock. The prestigious New York investment firm, Corporate Partners, makes large investments on behalf of state and corporate pension funds. Farmore had caught their eye because if it kept growing, it would be a great candidate for selling its shares on the New York Stock Exchange. The company was growing and had hoped to go public at some point, and by having a reputable uh, investment firm make a sizable investment would give a lot of credibility to the company and its stock for a future public offering. The stakes were substantial. Once Farmore went public, Monas, Shapiro, Finn, and everyone else with a piece of the company figured to realize the entrepreneurial dream, cashing in big time. Corporate partners wanted to invest $200 million. But first, quite naturally, they would send in their own accountants to check the books. Corporate partners would also make its decision by evaluating Mickey Monas in action. They picked an event that happened to show off his strengths as a showman in one of his favorite haunts. Each May, Las Vegas hosts the biggest real estate convention of the year. Every major retailer in the country attends, including far more, to make deals for new store locations. Realtors were intent on impressing far more. Monas was intent on impressing corporate partners. What Monas didn't know was that someone else was also watching him. Charity Embry, Farmore's legal counsel, had been asked to watch over Monas by Farmore's CEO, David Shapira, afraid Monas might jeopardize the corporate partners deal. But in the process, Embry picked up some alarming scuttlebutt. A Farmore vice president told her that some vendors were refusing to supply stores because bills were going unpaid. Embry worried about the image of cheerleaders wearing hot pants employed as company hostesses. She also heard about a senior VP of Coca-Cola who said he hated doing business with Farmore because he was always being pressured to support the World Basketball League. Embry documented her concerns in a confidential memo to David Shapira, covering everything from disgruntled vendors to cash flow problems. David Shapira received the incriminating memo shortly after Embry returned from the convention. So, what did the CEO do? He told her to rip it up. Embry chose to keep one copy anyway, and at the bottom she noted what Shapira had said that, quote, he was aware of most of the items listed in this memo, and that, quote, it was particularly important to rip it up now because of pending financing stock sale with CP, that is, corporate partners. If they went ahead with their stock purchase, corporate partners would own 17% of Farmore. David Shapira stood to make more than $2 million on the deal, Mickey Monas an even million. Shielded from the rumors, corporate partners saw only Farmore's commanding role at the convention, and they were suitably impressed. I think what they saw was what everybody else saw on the outside, this company with this unique buying philosophy and buying ability and low prices and, and rapid growth coming from nowhere to $3 billion in sales in, in record time, and the mystique that it was taking over the deep discount world and, 
and they were going to end up on top of the whole heap by the time it was done. Four weeks later, corporate partners announced their $200 million investment in Farmore. The official story was that this would give Farmore the much-needed cash to continue its aggressive growth plans. But there were more pressing needs for the money than growth, or even covering the fraud. Much of it had to go first towards paying off angry vendors. Had corporate partners known that their money was going to be used to pay Revlon and Procter and & Gamble and Helene Curtis invoices from three, four months ago, I don't think they ever would have invested in the company. But they didn't know, nor did anyone else. Welcome to the Million Dollar Farmore Championship, the Farmore in Youngstown. As summer spread across the Mahoning Valley, Mickey Monas presided over the annual Farmore Open, an LPGA tournament sponsored by Farmore. Farmore was now in the hole by 145 million, but Monas appeared as upbeat as ever at the tournament, where he would dole out half a million dollars in prize money. We got a little check here for her. $75,000 for first place. Much of it was raised from Farmore vendors. But Pat Finn was becoming more and more anxious. According to Finn, Monas had now distanced himself from managing the fraud, which required more attention than ever. And Finn was stuck with the responsibility of designing new ways to cover it up. My energy and people who work for me was going to cover up a situation and it really wasn't going towards uh, making Farmer a better company. And that really hurt. And I think we, we all long for the day that we could just kiss this goodbye and just dedicate ourselves to making the company better. About Pat having his own agenda, or he has his agenda. But if Finn still harbored some hope, Cheryl Steen and Anderson had lost the last shred of faith. John and I continually talked about the, the fraud and what we were going to do to resolve it. We had these discussions probably every day for lunch. And Pat was aware that we were talking about it all the time. And he knew that we were nervous. And it was those concerns that we brought to Pat's attention that really forced the April meeting. Finn now went to Monas and told him the junior executives were threatening to quit if something wasn't done to address the problem. A meeting was set for a Saturday morning in April of 92. Cheryl'stein was especially worried that if the fraud were discovered, Monas could lay blame on the accounting department. So I went into the April meeting knowing that I didn't want the situation blamed on me because I had just arrived six months earlier. So I decided to tape it. We're getting real close to audit time here. Right. And we've got some major problems out there. Right. And, you know, we're talking about how to cover it next year. Yeah. That assumes we get through an audit. And, you know, I'm on the front line out yeah, there. Yeah, I know that. With these auditors. And if something comes out the light, I'm there first. And yeah. I have to sit down and try and cover this stuff. And something comes out, you're going to have to get the pass. Uh, but the numbers are just, uh, well, the problems are multiplying and the numbers are multiplying. Yeah. Try to get through the audit. <laughs> We don't want to try it, and that's what we got to do. I mean, it's just, we need a good spy, obviously. Keep our fingers crossed and get through it and get the number down. Uh, leaving that meeting, you know, there, there was a very discouraging um, a feeling, a, a sense of almost that, um, you know, whatever the guy's saying probably is not going to happen. Mickey's personality is he's, in essence, he's a gambler. Uh, if he loses a bet, he's going to double up on the bet to hope, hope, hopefully the next time he can recover his, uh, his funds. It is very testy in Youngstown. Monus's penchant for doubling up his bets was about to prove his undoing. The WBL was a disaster, soaking up money. In the first year alone, Monus personally had to put up over a million dollars for the league, and still it wasn't enough. But where would he get more money to prop up the league? 
from a familiar source of funding as it happens, Farmore Vendors. Tom Zawistowski says Farmore's executive in charge of buying simply ordered vendors to become sponsors. We'd go to his office and he'd say, all right, you know, here's who I think we'll buy. You know, uh, Frito-Lay, uh, you know, Fuji Film, uh, you know, people like that. And then basically he'd get them on the speakerphone and he'd say, listen, you know, this is important to us. You're going to buy a $50,000 sponsorship, period. But when fans lost interest in Monus's basketball league, so did the sponsors. Remarkably, Monus directed that far more funds be used to keep the league going. Monus's signature had been printed on dozens of far more checks to prop up the basketball league. By 1991, millions of dollars had been embezzled. But then, a check to this travel agency for WBL expenses would cause the entire scheme to unravel. The travel agent showed the check to her landlord, who happened to be a far more investor. He brought it to the attention of David Shapira. David Shapira called in Pat Finn for an explanation. Now, try to put yourself in Pat Finn's shoes for a moment. What would you have done? Well, true to form, Finn stonewalled. Then admitted that a million dollars of far more money had gone to support Monus's basketball league. When in fact, more than 10 million had already been embezzled for this purpose. Shapira said he wanted to see the check registers himself. So, Finn raced back to Monus, afraid the entire fraud might now be exposed. Monus suggested one last desperate gamble. According to Finn, he said there was still time to paper over the WBL fraud as long as they didn't lose their nerve. I felt like I uh, was almost like in quicksand. I kept sinking deeper and deeper and deeper. But I always had a belief that we could fix it. I never wanted to tell myself that, uh, that we couldn't fix it. Because if we couldn't fix it, there was nothing but bad. I remember it very distinctly. He, he called Stan and myself in his office. And he said that, well, we have to, we have to get these checks and, and type over who they were paid out to or white out who they were paid to. I flat out refused. I, as soon as I heard that, I said, there's no way that I'm going to do that. Finally, someone had drawn the line. But there was still Stan Cheralstein. Finn asked his controller to come to his home the next morning. I arrived at Pat's house early Saturday morning. We looked through the journals very briefly before we looked at each other and knew that there was no way that we could cover up $10 million in advances to the World Basketball League. And I think at that point in time, he and I both knew that it was over. Cheralstein and Finn decided it was time to get a lawyer. They went to Cleveland attorney Jerry Gold with their story. They thought the worst would happen, they'd get fired. Yeah, as soon as I learned the amount of money involved, uh, nobody walks away from those kind of situations. When you sign your name and somebody loses $100 million, uh, you can't walk away. Early the next week, the first public sign that something might be amiss was a broadcast of Farmore's employees. Good afternoon, everybody. Mickey Monis and David Shapira announced a corporate readjustment. The board of directors of Farmore, in conjunction with David and myself, have come up with a restructuring plan. I will relinquish my roles as president and chief operating officer and become a vice chairman of the office of the chairman. In fact, Shapira had wanted to fire Monus. He was convinced by board members to keep him on until investigations were complete, in a position of no real power. Uh, I will be the new chief operating officer. Uh, the uh, senior vice presidents will report to me. Um, I'm going to be running the business on a day-to-day -day basis. His bet on Monus gone bad, Shapiro needed to find out how much money was missing. Who did he turn to? The auditors, Coopers and Librand. When we first heard that these checks had been found, we pulled together the uh, audit team who simply went out to start 
start digging into areas that uh, uh, had not been dug into prior to, uh, to this discovery. Coopers began interviewing employees who could tell them what they'd missed. John Anderson was anxious to talk. They needed my help. I knew that I wanted divorced from, from the Pat Finn situation. And, um, and I must admit I was overwhelmed, but at the same time I was, I was, I was not hesitant or reluctant at all to kind of show them everything that I knew what was going on. Anderson told them the WBL payments were just the beginning of a huge fraud. With Anderson leading them by the hand, Cooper has now discovered the full extent of what it had missed during four years of audits. And Farmore's board now discovered the awful truth. Charles Cohen, a Farmore director, says the board was shocked. It was at that point that we realized that we were talking about a massive accounting fraud in which the uh, accounting department, apparently under the direction of Mickey Monas, had cooked the books at, uh, in a world-class way. The board had to do something. It fired the auditors, blaming them for not finding the fraud. The game was over. In fact, the company that even Walmart feared hadn't earned a dime in five years. A tip about a check for travel arrangements had led to the discovery of one of the biggest corporate frauds in U.S. history. Pat Finn had decided to come clean and confess everything. But there was one great danger, that he would be blamed for the whole thing if Monas were to claim ignorance of the fraud. So on Tuesday, July 28th, Finn called Monas at home. Hello? Mac. Yeah. What's going on? How you doing? Not good. Finn wanted tape proof of Monas's involvement to take with him when he went to the authorities. I mean, when we, when we go in and we talk about this, I mean, are you going to protect me and my guys and say that, you know, you basically were authorizing this? I'm going to protect you. What am I going to tell him? I mean, what am I going to tell him? That I didn't know anything about it? Is that what you mean? No, I mean, you almost have to say that you authorized it. I mean, that, that you knew about it. I'm going to say, I know we had, a, we had a bucket to cover the gross profit, and we weren't covering it, and it got away from us. That's what I'm going to say, okay? Oh, yeah. Man, I just feel we're going to just cook. The next day, Finn turned himself and the tape over to the authorities. For Mickey Monas, it also appeared to be over. Farmore fired him, and he was indicted on 129 criminal counts. The government accused him of directing the fraud. Their chief witness would be his protege, Pat Finn. I'm really not going to comment on the case. We're not going to talk about the case. I appreciate that you have a job to do. We're not going to talk about the case. Okay. If convicted, Monas would face life in prison and fines of more than $36 million. Overnight, Farmore's image of success was snuffed out. I'd like to kill him. <laughs> yeah. I really would. Thousands of employees were laid off when the company filed for bankruptcy, revealing that it needed half a billion dollars to erase the losses. In desperation, Farmore closed half the stores Monas had opened. And the shockwave spread quickly across the nation's business community, as suppliers, banks, and investors learned that they'd been backing a loser all these years. Anthony Cafaro's company lost more than nine million dollars. Everybody gets hurt. I mean, all the employees, obviously the investors, the stock is worth virtually nothing. Many of the vendors actually lost money or will lose. They're not going to be paid dollar for dollar when the bankruptcy comes out. Uh, the banks, the lenders have lost. Um, who's, who's made money on it? I, nobody has, ultimately. The only people that come out are the attorneys at the end. 
A slew of legal suits followed as investors and lenders hurried to stake their claims. Farmore's last official act before it filed for bankruptcy was to sue Coopers and Librand, claiming their audits fell far short of accounting standards, were in fact incompetent. I have been around audits for uh, almost 30 years, and I'm a professor of securities regulation, so I have read many cases involving auditors. Um, a normal, careful audit by attentive managers and staff, uh, in my opinion, uh, should have and would have exposed some of the failures that occurred here. But Coopers and Librand has its excuse. It was royally snookered, just like everyone else. When you have the most senior management of the company, particularly its financial management, uh, consciously setting out to fool the auditors, uh, to hide information from them, as they've testified in the Monas trial, it's very hard to get around that kind of activity uh, by, the, by the senior management. But according to the SEC, auditors have a responsibility to do more. The auditors at the end of the day have no room to compromise. They have a responsibility to dig deeper, to be skeptical, to ask questions and to impose a discipline on management and on the financial reporting process that may otherwise not be there. If found negligent, Coopers will be liable for hundreds of millions of dollars, but they're fighting back. We're suing David Shapira as the CEO, uh, and our assertion is that he either knew or was recklessly indifferent in not knowing of what was going on around him. Uh, we believe that they are principally responsible for the fraud. But now answer me this. How can there be a crime involving half a billion dollars where everyone is a victim? The accountants, the board of directors, the chief executive, all failed to prevent it from happening, all claim it was the other guy's fault. They blame each other, and above all, Mickey Monas, the self-deluded gambler. But how far are self-delusion and gambling from the positive traits of optimism and daring which we expect from our entrepreneurs? Not that far, perhaps. Which is why we also expect those in oversight positions to keep an eye on those taking the risks. When they don't, we wind up in court. Because without controls, a system based on gambling and self-delusion will tend to run amok. Surprising to many, Mickey Monas's first trial ended in a hung jury. Oh no, we had our minds made up. He was as guilty as I'm standing here. Really? There's more than enough facts to convict, I feel. But some people just refuse to see the facts. Who was undecided? One person hung the whole jury, every single count. I believe the person was paid off, myself. Just, I mean, tax The FBI jury. is taking these allegations seriously and is investigating for possible jury tampering. While Monas continues to maintain he did nothing wrong, Farmore is attempting to dig itself out of bankruptcy. By cutting expenses and closing their money-losing stores, they might yet stage a comeback. Uh, and and David Shapira never responded to repeated requests for an interview. He still uh, sits on Farmore's board, across the table from corporate partners, which is suing him to recover their $200 million investment. Might be occurring to you. John Anderson, in return for his cooperation, was never prosecuted. Despite his role in hiding the fraud for four years, he still sees himself as a victim. You see him? I used to have this belief that all people were good and that all people had good intentions. And where I'm at right now is I really have a hard time trusting people. And that's something I have to learn to do again because I want to do that again. But having been through this particular experience, it really has, has made me look at people and situations in business in an unfavorable manner. And I have to, to learn to trust people again. Stan Charlstein was fired by Farmore, but never charged with anything. He's named in several civil suits brought by investors, and now works in Florida as an accountant. I really think that the situation at Farmore occurs at small companies, in middle-sized companies, all the time. And my recommendation to any accountants 
or chief financial officers would be don't let it happen don't let it start because once you start it's very easy to let it happen a second time and who knows where it, where it will end it ended in jail for Pat Finn last February having admitted his responsibility for crafting the fraud he reported to a federal prison to begin serving a 33 month sentence it's okay to be loyal it's okay to uh, to uh, as I did try to build a company to nurture something from the beginning but never never lose sight of yourself never compromise yourself for that it's not worth it it's not worth it no matter how much of a team ball player you think you are you're just destroying yourself and destroying things that are that are important to you you can understand certain things you can understand aggressive accounting you can understand people who are executives who are hard charging who are optimistic that's how they get to be leaders those very things that made someone a superb executive a superb accountant a superb chief financial officer sometimes also make them a superb criminal mickey monis is still gambling still denying everything and now awaits the start of his second trial the jury will have to decide whether mickey monis is a crook or just a hard-driving entrepreneur what a sad day it is for Youngstown. What a black day it but is now, for Youngstown. Like you say, he brought a lot of uh, value and positive things I to the valley. I felt because it's and another black run against that. our town. Mm -hmm. And it seems that we're, we seem to be so gullible that we oh, want uh, to... Hey, I, I compare Mickey Moe kind of like to, uh, to Richard Nixon. He just got caught. <laughs>